Hello, everyone. Uh, next up, we have a talk by Graham Dumpleton about uh, building an interactive training environment using Jupyter Hub. You may know Graham by being the author of Mod Whiskey and also Raft, an evil monkey patching library. That better, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how long you have been uh, programming in software, whether it's like you're a newbie or whether you've been doing it for far too long, My, myself, which is over 30 years, I think, which is gonna be longer than some of you people are old. Uh, we, we all end up in this situation where we just don't know how to get something to work. It frustrates us and so on. So learning is a big problem of how to use software. Uh, the usual way we go about it these days is we just go out and find whatever online doc documentation we can find. Uh, or if you're old, mightly, old like me, you may remember books. Um, but frankly, I've, I don't think I've seen anyone reading paper books for a long time. Um, but more often what happens is you end up on Stack Overflow uh, and you try and find whatever you can to find and solve your one specific problem, cut and paste it and use that. And part of the problem here is that over time, software has just got too complex for us to be able to understand it all. Back when I started programming, we would have a team of developers working for like months to create something which you can download as a little package on NPM or PyPI package index and install and get it going. Uh, so with that growing complexity, it's just become really, really hard to be able to understand everything in these systems because things are just too complicated now. So learning is a big problem. Now, from where I come, I'm a developer advocate with Red Hat. Uh, now, we deal with customers, and you know, customers out there, the organizations, they don't really like the idea of having people squirreling, squirreling away in the corner trying to work things out themselves. Okay, it might, as you at home, developing on your own stuff, it's the only, only option you've got. But when we work with com companies, they prefer to have more structured training uh, where you can come in and actually set them up an environment where they can sit down and do the workshop. They also then like to be able to take those workshops back and do them as self-paced things at their own pace again for do them again or if people weren't available at the workshop. Now, this is not so simple. When it's a supervised training environment and you have classroom there with all the computers set up there, then you can pre-install everything on those machines so that it's gonna all work and you know it works. But if you move into self-paced uh, workshop learning, especially where people are going to do it on their own machines, it's almost impossible to get it right the first time. Everyone's machines are different. You have people with Macs or Linux or Windows, or you've got that one person who, who insists on using their Surface uh, um, tablet and no, they won't touch anything else. Um, so there's a big problem. So it's always people will try and do these workshops that you're providing them and they'll go, it doesn't work. And you have to, well, it works for me, the you using. So it's a very hard or impossible task to solve. Um, and that comes down to that issue of reproducible environments. Uh, everyone may have Python 2.7 uh, still on their laptops be using that. Hopefully you're all on newer versions. Uh, but there's a lot of organisations out there aren't going to be on Python free hit. They may well still be on 2.7 and it's a bit of an annoying thing that everyone's so rah, rah, oh yeah, Python 2.7 support's coming to an end next year. We should all be on Python free. There are going to be organisations out there for a long time still on the old Python 2.7 uh, and it's a problem we have to deal with. Now you can get training environments out there which you can pull down uh, or will use. One is Open edX, so it's a platform where you can uh, install it yourself, or you can get all your workshop environments in that and set it up and use it. These systems tend to be uh, based around virtual machines uh, for deploying environments and they can be a very heavyweight solution, not very easy to set up. Uh, so this isn't necessarily a good solution for us either. We need to be able to quickly set up these training environments. And we, like, we, for each workshop, we'll actually literally set up a whole Kubernetes cluster, for example, and need to go and reinstall something training environment in it. So the environment takes half an hour to, to start up. We don't want to then spend three hours trying to set up a workshop environment for a workshop that's only going to take two hours. Uh, so big problems. 
So they aren't necessarily good solutions. Um, we don't want to use host online ones because we need to use in our own environments. And I mentioned the VMs. Um, so our solution to this is trying to use containerization. I uh, rely on that. Now, everyone here I'm sure now is familiar with uh, con the idea of containers and Docker. You've heard the buzzword from the last few years. And hopefully a lot of you have played with it because it is an interesting technology. But the idea of containerization is that you can package up the software you need to run uh, with all the bits and pieces, the correct operating system version, all the language tools you need, the version of Python and so on, but also the application you want to run on top. So in our case, we want to have a workshop training environment. So we can package all that up together and actually also add the content for a workshop in and create that into an image, which when we can run up that image and give that to someone and they can run up their own Docker runtime, for example, and they can get exactly what they need. It's a reproducible environment at that point. We don't want to target just Docker, though. Uh, for the things we do, uh, we do a lot of stuff with Kubernetes and OpenShift, which is Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes. So we're doing training in that. So we need to be able to also uh, be able to bring it up in that, that more big cluster environment, not a single desktop environment. Because if we had just an image, we'd, we'd have different problems if we were trying to do it on people's own computers. Well, they've got to get Docker installed. Uh, then they've got to pull down the image and run it up, which never, never works. Because if you, especially if you hire a training environment, a room, the Wi-Fi never works. So you're not going to pull down um, one gigabyte image um, into, a, into a root environment. So our solution was to create a thing called Homeroom. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick demo of it so you get a feel for what it is I'm talking about. So I've got one here I prepared earlier, just in case it didn't start up on me. Uh, is that too big? Can I make that a little bit smaller? So this is what we have. So we have our training environment. This is all done in the web browser. Uh, so people don't need to install anything on their own laptop or computer that they've got. They'll just go to the website, and they get in that web browser. On the left-hand side, their content for the workshop. On the right-hand side, they get one or two, two terminals. And this is actually terminal is running in a running a shell inside of a container in our cluster. Um, in it, it has all of the different tools that they required. So if we need, and I'm going to get the option wrong here. No, I got it right. If we need a particular version of Python installed, then we can have it all pre-installed for them, and all the tools are there. Nothing to install. Now we do do with Kubernetes, so we can also put some uh, extra nice stuff in here. We can actually embed in there a um, web console for accessing the Kubernetes cluster. And that means that uh, when I go through these instructions, and I'm going to skip ahead here and find the right page because it's not on the first page, unfortunately. So first off, I can go through my instructions. One thing we do in this environment is you don't need to type anything if you don't have to. I can just click on that command on the left-hand side. Now, in the case of Kubernetes, because we're actually running a terminal in the cluster, it's all set up so that we can deploy things in that cluster. That's the next page. So I can go and create the database. It started, it started doing a deployment. I can go to my web console, uh, and so on and so on. And we can also embed slides in here. Now, if anyone's got a laptop open and you want to cause havoc with my environment, you can ignore the text. But if you go to that URL, you can go there and spin up an instance right now. And I'll, I'll be able to see it. Um, be able to drop back over. If you go to that URL, you'll actually find um, a few different little workshops I've thrown up. Uh, so if you want to come back later and have a play with, you can. Uh, so and see what it does. But that is the, the workshop. It's a bitly link, homeroom pycon au 19 So hopefully you remember that. So that's my little demo of what this environment is about and what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide a, a workshop training environment in the browser. No one needs to install anything locally. They can just get started straight away. So that's the aim of it. Now, this is all well and good if we need a, want a single environment. And I mentioned the fact that we bundle this up an image, so we can give that image to someone, and they can just start up in their own Docker environment. But we want to set up a classroom environment. We want to have multiple users be able to actually come in and do stuff. Uh, if you do go to that link, uh, you'll come in. You won't need to log in or anything. You'll just uh, get immediately get an anonymous account. So we have an issue of both anonymous, but also perhaps wanting to sign people up. 
So how do we do that? You know, we can run an image up very simply. So this is where JupyterHub came in for us. Now, the thing is, you might be scratching your head if you know what JupyterHub is. You know, JupyterHub is for setting up Jupyter Notebooks, isn't it? Uh, who's used Jupyter Notebooks and JupyterHub? I tell you, a lot of people. So you've milled it. So you may think, well, what's going on here? I, I'm not seeing a Jupyter Notebook. And that is because JupyterHub, although it's associated with Jupyter Notebooks, and I've never actually seen anyone use it for anything but Jupyter Notebooks, you can actually use it to start up and manage other applications. It does not have to be a Jupyter Notebook. So the architecture of JupyterHub and the way it works, and why this is possible, is that you would come in and hit the URL for JupyterHub, and the first thing it's going to try and do is authenticate you. Now, um, in the one I've got running, it's just going to actually authenticate you, essentially just give you a user account automatically as an anonymous user, but you can hook it up to different authentication. Only once you're authenticated, it will then actually start up an instance of the Jupyter Notebook usually just for you, and that's done by this spawner. Uh, so everyone's going to get their own instance of it. Uh, but the thing is, I can replace that Jupyter Note with something else. And in order to use Jupyter Hub, it's going to create the all instances for each user as separate applications on the, the host it's running. And that's what's called using the local process spawner. Uh, but there are lots and lots of other options. You, the whole system is pluggable. I can plug it in a different spawner. So usually it's just run this command on the same host. But if I've got a Docker image, I can use the Docker spawner to actually spawn up those in different containers on the same host. If I use a Fargate spawner, or I can deploy, the, run up those instances up on Amazon. If it's Kubernetes, and I'm running in a Kubernetes cluster, then I can spawn up them in different containers in Kubernetes. So this is great. I need to just create an image, and I can use the Kubernetes spawner in my case and run up an instance in my existing Kubernetes cluster. So we did that. We joined JupyterHub with Kubernetes, KubeSpawner, and we brought out our own image. So all I need to do is I just need to configure that into JupyterHub. And one of the things I love about JupyterHub is that the configuration file is Python code. Now I can do all sorts of magic in there, as you'll see later on. So to tell it to use the Kubernetes spawner, once I've got JupyterHub running in my, my cluster, I just need to say, I want to use this spawner class for KubeSpawner, tell it the image I want to use, which is my workshop image, which is going to have all of my language runtimes, my uh, workshop environment, and my content all in that one image, and just tell it to start it up. Um, start command and also the port it needs to listen. And away I'll go. Um, and in case of uh, Kubernetes, that just means that I'll get a separate instance. In Kubernetes speak, what we call a pod. Uh, it's actually equivalent to a container, um, in usually. It's usually a pod is one container. You can actually fit more than one there. But, but if you're familiar with running stuff up in, in Docker, it's the same thing. Okay? Sarah users are going to get their own instance. Now, with the authentication, it also is pluggable. And I can uh, bring in any sorts of authentication in there as well. So if I want anonymous authentication, I can put the configuration to be this temp authenticator. And it won't actually ask me anything. It'll say, OK, I'll allocate your username and, and just let you straight in. And if you've ever used the tempnb.org uh, service for spinning up Jupyter Notebooks in the browser uh, yourself on, off, off the internet without actually installing anything, it uses a temp authenticator. Uh, but you can also hook it up to other authentication systems, and there's a whole bunch there. You know, Google's one, there's GitHub, Azure, a whole lot of uh, ones based around OAuth. Um, there's a generic one there, so you could then attach it to Keycloak and start hooking into all sorts of things like LDAP and all sorts of things. See, it's all pluggable. Um, so that all works, but a few cautions. And like, So I find it great. So the reason this talk is to just educate people that you can actually do this. You can bring in your own apps with JupyterHub and use the fact that it is provides a service of spawning up applications and authentication, because you may find a use for it in your own environment. If you don't want to make an application multi-tenant for users, uh, but you want to provide them a single instance at any time to work in, you could use this. And especially if you're using Docker or Kubernetes underneath, it becomes a, a really nice way of packaging things up and doing it. There's some problems. There's a few things you need to worry about. So this is another way of looking at JupyterHub. Uh, 
So up the front of Jupyter Hub is this thing called the configurable HTTP proxy. That's where your request comes in. So normally your first request comes in and it goes into the Jupyter Hub, the hub instance, the hub part. It authenticates you, it will spawn up an instance for you, and it creates your separate notebook usually, and then you'll be redirected over to the notebook. Okay. Now our first problem is this. The default way that Jupyter Hub runs is that your particular notebook or application or training environment, it's under the same host name as Jupyter Hub. They're all just, it's at a different sub URL. So the first thing you need to be able to handle with your application is you need to be able to run it at a sub URL. Uh, you need to say, okay, I don't want you to work at the root of the host, I want you to have everything underneath slash username. And, and Jupyter Hub will tell you that when it runs up the instance of your app, it'll tell you what your prefix is that you have to use. So your app just has to handle it. Now the next one, and this one's much, much more important. Uh, when you've authenticated, the hub will redirect you over to your particular instance of your application at that sub URL prefix. After that point, all of your traffic only traverses via that configurable HTTP proxy at the front. There's no checks again on authentication after that point. The authentication was done up front by the hub, but then all the requests go straight to your app. That means that if you gave that URL to, out to someone else, someone else could access that app without actually going through authentication. So that's a security problem, obviously. Now, the way that Jupyter Notebooks handles that is it does a bit of magic. When a request comes through, it knows it's running in a way that it's, it's got to do some extra secondary authorization. So it'll come through to the notebook app and go, oh, well, you're not authorized to me. I will actually send you back to JupyterHub after it just came from there and ask JupyterHub to essentially go through a secondary OAuth handshake. Uh, and so JupyterHub will say, yes, yes, you are valid to use this. I'll then send you back against the notebook with a token. Um, and then the notebook will check that token back with the hub and know, okay, you are good. I'll set another cookie so that the authentication's all checked. Now, your application you need to run is going to have to do that. You have to do that secondary authorization check. And JupyterHub will pass in some information to help you with that. It will give you um, the token you need to, to talk back to uh, JupyterHub um, and uh, the JupyterHub API URLs where we can talk to it. And you also have to work out the host name. So you're going to do a little bit of mucking around there. And I, OAuth confuses me all the time, so don't ask me questions about how they exactly work because I keep forgetting. Uh, but there is magic needed there. So there are the two things. If, as long as you can solve those problems, you can get an app running on a JupyterHub and, and have it done safely. I suppose this was some of the issues, other, ish, other things we can do. Um, memory and CPU and managing them. JupyterHub does allow you to actually put controls on how much uh, that particular instance uses uh, so you don't run things away. You can set memory limits and you can set CPU limits. Uh, they are generic settings on the spawner uh, in, in JupyterHub, so it is dependent on a particular spawner type uh, being able to support those, and Kube Spawner does. Uh, so it will actually then lock you down so you can say that, oh, well, I only want to give that particular instance one gigabyte of memory. Okay. Uh, next thing is controlling how many sessions you can start up. Uh, you don't want to have this you know, one box, and my, my set box you're using here is 64 gigabytes uh, memory. It's not going to be no good if like 1,000 people come and try and use that book, box. I'm going to run out of memory quickly. So you can actually set the number of active limits, so that's another thing you need to, to consider. And these are all settings you just put in that same setting file I showed earlier with the, the Coops Warner and uh, authentication plugins defined. Another thing you need to worry about is uh, session culling. So every time a user comes in, you're going to get your own individual session, uh, and they will stay up and running. Well, they'll stay up there forever if you don't do anything else. If the person closes that browser and goes away, you don't want it sitting there and never getting cleaned up. But this is where JupyterHub Hub just becomes really, really nice for doing this sort of thing, because you can configure it uh, to essentially cull those idle applications which have been left there for too long when the browser's been closed off and gone away. And the way it does this is that Jupyter Hub has this idea of plugging in additional services. So I can set up this service there, a cull idle service, and I say, this is the command you need to run to run this. And you put that in the config, and when JupyterHub starts up, 
it will run this sub-process within the same uh, place where JupyterHub is running, and that sub-process can then call back into the API of JupyterHub and go keep polling every minute and saying, okay, what idle sessions are there out there? Now, it knows it's idle because that, Jupyter, that haste, configurable HTTP proxy at the front tracks whether there is any idle activity. And so you can query all of that. If it's idle, I can then start shutting things down. So that's JupyterHub by itself. Uh, we haven't really done anything weird with it at that point, uh, except for plugging our own app. But when we talk about Jup Kubernetes and training we want to do, we want to be able to do more than that. Like with Jupyter Notebooks, not what normally happens, you get your own little spot to play, and you could create up, open up your notebooks and start doing things in, within that um, what place where that is. Uh, we want to do things extra. We want to be able to control things and do extra things within the Kubernetes cluster so we can actually give training where we're teaching people how to deploy apps in Kubernetes. So we want a place to play. So JupyterHub normally would be deployed in a project. In this case, it's called Grumpy because I'm the grumpy old man and I always like using that name. Um, so the top one, lab workshop content, that's actually the hub. The, the one below it is the instance I got from my particular session. Uh, but JupyterHub has these really nice places where you can hook things in. It has what's called a, a pre-spawn hook and also a modified pod hook for kubespawner in particular. So I can actually dump more Python code in that config which intercepts these hooks and does extra stuff. So in my case, what we've done with our training environment is that when the user comes in, they not only get the, the workshop environment, it will go off and create them a separate what, called a namespace in Kubernetes. It's their own little area where you can deploy their own applications. Uh, there's a few steps to that. And this is where I mean about putting extra code in the config. This is literally in the config file. <laughs> like, there's a lot of stuff around this, but this is straight in the config file. Um, I should be good and refactor it and set module. I haven't even done that yet. Uh, we want to be able to control what people can do in that cluster. We, we, if we just give them a project or a project namespace, we want to make sure that's the only thing they can work with. And the way that Kubernetes works, that is the idea of service accounts. It's like a user. Uh, so you can set up a service account. So for every different user, we'll give them a separate service account. And their instance of a home room would then actually run under that service account. And the only thing that that service account can control or access is that other project. So that's the only thing there. Uh, Normally when you work with Kubernetes, it's a big problem that if you give access to people uh, a Kubernetes cluster, often they can actually do everything. But we lock it down and it's using in Kubernetes what's called role-based access control. So we have a service account, we've created that. Uh, we've created our namespace uh, and we will then actually set up a role binding so that service account it can only access that namespace. So that means then now within that terminal, I can actually start running commands to, to deploy commands in, in Kubernetes. And it's all automatically linked up to that namespace, so I can create up my application. Uh, the next thing we can do is that we often have workshops where people, because they're being given a restricted environment, there's things they can't do. Like, there are certain things in Kubernetes where you need to be a cluster admin to be able to do it. So we obviously can't give that to people when it's a shared cluster and everyone's working in the same cluster because they'll all just go havoc and start deleting everyone else's other stuff and things like that, unless they do play nice. So what we've done is that as well as hooking to those things of creating the project, we've hooked in and said, OK, we can give it a list of resources in Kubernetes we want you to create. And that then triggers the deployment of apps automatically into that project we've created. Now, one example of this is working with operators. With operators, you need to be able to um, set up some global resources in the whole cluster. And an operator in um, uh, Kubernetes, you can, you can uh, imagine as being like a, a version of a software reliability engineer in, in software. Uh, the software, en software reliability engineer, if you know the term, is someone who keeps infrastructure running. Uh, so you're taking the knowledge that person has and putting in an operator. So we do a lot of workshops with this. So we need to get that thing installed first because the user themselves can't install it because they need the elevator privileges. But we can do that. We can give it all these resources, set things up. Um, and it's interesting because I did all of this stuff and I was replacing Jupyter Notebooks and actually had someone come to me a problem, uh, how do I do this with Jupyter Hub for Jupyter Notebooks? They wanted to be able to have uh, access to some pre-configured services so that Jupyter Notebook could use them. So I actually went and took this whole environment we've created 
took it and took out my homeroom dashboard and put Jupyter Notebook in, back in. So I can actually go back and use this for Jupyter Notebook still. And what would happen is the user would come in, they'd get their Jupyter Notebook, but in behind, they're in that separate project that the Jupyter Notebook environment was linked to, it installed them a version of Dask. And then that from the Jupyter Notebook is automatically can then use that Dask cluster. Okay? So it's not just for training. There's actually applications this back in the Jupyter world as well. Uh, now that creation of all the resources, um, again, that's just uh, relying on the, we can have a list of resources and we use a dynamic API client for Kubernetes and it means that it can just work it all out and dunk it in there. I'm running out of time, so I'd be very quick. Um, we also can set quotas uh, so we can remove any existing quotas that the cluster may set up by default uh, and we can uh, then put our own in. Uh, more importantly is that, one again, with culling of idle sessions, we also need to cull dead projects. So we have a, a way of uh, hooking in another service there to, to kill those as well. So deployment options, we have a whole bunch of ways we can deploy this. Uh, the anonymous user one is one called the Learning Portal. So this is something we could host up permanently on the net. People can come along and use it any time. We have others, have others as well where we can tie it into OpenShift or own authentication uh, or also set up it with Key Cloak and, and have registration and so on. And the registration, that one is good because it means we don't actually have to create user accounts inside of the OpenShift cluster. For content creation, uh, we have a number of different uh, Docker images. Um, so a terminal one is a base one, which all that provides is a terminal, uh, so that we can actually use this like a terminal server as well. If you want people to be able to work with a Kubernetes cluster without installing anything locally, you can install all the kube tools, give them just a terminal. Uh, or we have our dashboard one, which has builds on top of that so that you can then actually put your content in. And content essentially is essentially just creating a derived Docker image, put that content there in the certain directories in the certain structure, and it'll all get used automatically. So successful failure. Well, for this it worked really well. Uh, JupyterHub provide this means of sporting applications for us. Uh, it can manage reaping of those idle application instances. Uh, we could plug in a, the Kubernetes spawner, we could plug in our own, own authentication. Uh, it had all that proxying to the instances of applications and it was all configurable by Python code. So we could do all sorts of crazy stuff with the REST API in Kubernetes to deploy apps uh, and so on. Uh, now, if we did it again, would we do it any differently? Uh, I'd probably actually say no. Um, well, sort of no. Um, when I started this, uh, this thing, the Kubernetes has this thing called Operate, which I mentioned, it didn't exist. Um, but it exists now. So if it did do it over, I may use Kubernetes operators, but I may not. But more likely, I wouldn't for all of it, because we'd still have to deal with uh, authentication, uh, for example. So we might end up with a hybrid application if we were real. We still have a web application service. You come in, you authenticate. You say what works you want to run. And that might then create some resources which the operator responds to that actually then create instances and so on and handles routing. Um, but JupyterHub has been really good for you. Um, so if you do need this sort of thing for running up apps on demand uh, with authentication and so on, that's really good. So it's worth a look. So if you are interested, um, there's... The, the official main repo on OpenShift is uh, this OpenShift-Homeroom. Uh, there's only a few things in there at the moment because we're trying to move a lot of stuff from this uh, separate OpenShift Labs one uh, and get it all in the Homeroom one. Um, but this there, um, that the top one there, that Lab Workshop content, is actually a workshop on how to create workshop content. Um, so we're trying to use the system itself of how to, how to do it. Now, right now, it is... Uh, although you can take an individual image and run that up in Docker or deploy it in Kubernetes, the actual whole thing of using JupyterHub and the spawner, it, it's got some uh, dependencies on OpenShift and the way we do things at the moment, but I'm trying to actually move from that to being this being usable in a plain Kubernetes cluster as well. Uh, but if you're interested in doing that, yeah, do come and talk to me and try and work out where the roadmap is on that one. So finally, that to me, uh, we've only got about two minutes left. Uh, so if you want to quickly get that, and I'll go back and put that uh, URL up again if you uh, want to look at that. Um, but as I said, that's I put up a few different... Um, you all got your photos? I'll leave that up there till tomorrow or some other, when I remember to get rid of it. Um, 
But there, I put a few up there. There's a, there's a course there which takes about 30, 40 minutes on Kubernetes fundamentals, uh, which is the one I had running. Uh, there's another one, how to deploy Jupyter Notebooks inside of uh, Kubernetes using OpenShift. Uh, there's that one on creating the workshop content. And there's another one here with uh, an example of uh, operators. That one actually has something pre-deployed. So you can go in there, feel free to play around. Uh, each one's got, I think, a, set, a limit of eight sessions at a time. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get that many people in there. Uh, and I don't hopefully think you'll overrun my cluster. Um, I hope. <laughs> um, and that's it. Um, so I'll just quickly put this back up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Graham. That was thank a real you. good talk. We've got a mug and some pins inside okay. to thank you for the uh, good presentation.